Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first Sunday of 2020. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we'd like to welcome you. Also, I'd like to ask you if you might fill out the uh, flap that's on the front of the bulletin and place that in the offering plate as it's passed. Also, if you have any prayer requests, you can note it on that flap. And uh, then I'd like to remind you all to pass the uh, red book down and sign that as, um, as, you, as you pass it down your pew. Um, I missed, and we don't have any anniversaries this week, but I missed one last week because I just stopped at, two, at 2019. On the first, I missed Andy, or Amy and Randy's anniversary, so I hope you had a wonderful anniversary. Good, good. And then uh, on the seventh, we have Joe McClintock's birthday. We hope you have a beautiful, wonderful birthday. Um, <laughs> we uh, like to ask you to continue to play, pray for our missionaries that we have. We don't have a, a one that we're emphasizing this month that I'm aware of at this point. But so just emphasize all of them. Announcements today at five o'clock is evening services. Followed at 6 o'clock by youth. Then on Monday, uh, 7.30 to 4, Head Start be in the fellowship hall. Then Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock a.m., there's an adult breakfast. 9.30, ladies' prayer. 3.45, Circle J. 6 o'clock, choir. I'd like to put a little plug there. We kind of had a, a two-week break on choir practice. So we're going to start up again this Wednesday night. If you're interested, you've been sitting back in the pew thinking that you might like to do this. This is the perfect time to start. We're going to start working on some Easter music and as well as our uh, sun, regular Sunday anthems. So if you'd like to sing, we'd love to have you. We've always got a place for you. And then four o'clock uh, Thursday at 4 o'clock, Head Start again is in the fellowship hall. So if you have plans for that, you probably want to find someplace else. On Tuesday the 14th at 10 o'clock, the ladies will be browning hamburger for the soup supper. So if you've got a large skillet or an electric skillet you can bring to do that, please bring it. They'll also have a lunch at lunchtime. And then the next Thursday, the following Thursday on the 16th will be the annual youth soup supper. Uh, that'll be Thursday from 5 to 7 on the 16th. And again, there's a sign-up sheet outside the office if you'd like to provide some ingredients or desserts or whatever. Then, the following Sunday is the annual meeting of the First Baptist Church Clay Center. Uh, that'll happen immediately after our worship service. And if you are involved in a mission, a board, or a committee, they really need to have your reports into the office by the 12th, which is next Sunday, so they can be included in the annual report. Then the last thing I have is that volunteers are needed for the nursery or welcoming guests on Sunday morning. So if you have any interest in doing that, if you contact the office, that would be uh, appreciated. Then as we begin our time of praise, I just had some thoughts. Um, you know, we're when, when we pray, when we gather to worship like this, we're here to praise God. It's not about what we like, what songs we sing. We're not here to be entertained or to entertain. We're here to worship our Lord. And um, so that's what we're about. And as we go through this, it doesn't make any difference if the song is contemporary, <laughs> traditional, country, pop, pop, rope, whatever. It's how we sing it. If we sing it from our hearts and not our heads, that's what God's after, and that's what we need to be doing as we sing. So as we go throughout this year, I'd like to kind of focus on making sure that we have a, a good perspective on, on our worship, that we are worshiping and that we're singing from our hearts and our souls to God. We're not just singing it from our head. So now if you'd sing and stand together, we'll sing Let There Be Praise, um, followed by... Um, page 686 in the hymn, so let it come from your heart, let it come from your soul, as we sing.
rejoice that we can, we can meet here as a family and that we can worship you collectively. We pray for uh, your guidance. We pray for your love. And we pray for your, our salvation. We thank you for giving us those things so freely. We ask that you be in our presence this morning. We ask that the things we do say and the things that we feel might be pleasing in your sight. We ask that you be with our pastor as he delivers your message and be with us as we sing and praise you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture this morning is taken out of the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is, is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Please be seated. back to you that you might bless each gift, that you might bless each giver, and that these gifts might be used in your will for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. with us, Lord. We seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we do ask that you would work in our lives. 
individually and collectively as a body of believers. We thank you for each one that is here. We're mindful that, again, many are away um, with the holidays and traveling, and we pray that you give them safety as they do travel, Lord. We pray that in their absence that they will know that they are still in our hearts. We lift to you the requests that have been shared and ask that you would work in each of these situations. We pray uh, with Mike McMahon's family on his, um, on his loss, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would bless and encourage his family, that you would just, as the promised uh, comforter of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would minister comfort and peace to them. We pray, too, with Ken, uh, Ken Shivers and his family, that you would minister peace and comfort to them. Uh, we pray also uh, with the Brown family and uh, their child, a three-week-old, that has to have heart surgery in Kansas City, Lord. We lift that baby up to you and ask, Lord, that you would work in that situation, that everything would go well, that there would be no problems or complications. We pray for others that are having difficulties, illness, injury, Lord, and we lift them to you and pray that you would work in those situations. We pray, too, for our nominating committee as that time, uh, the time for the election of officers is approaching, and we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to work in that process, and Lord, we give you all the glory, honor in that. And Lord, as we begin this new year, we are mindful of our many friends um, of the church that are shut-ins, that aren't able to be part of the service any longer, and we just pray, Lord, that you would minister peace and encouragement to them. Uh, we think of Betty and Billy and Karen and Letha, Pat and Lynn and Suzanne and Martha, Lord. And we just lift them all up to you and ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon them. And we think, too, of Anita, uh, that you would just watch over all of them. And, uh, Lord, we pray that as we are able, that we would take the opportunity to visit and to encourage them uh, as friends and members of our church. Again, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for what you've accomplished already in this service, and we know that you have great things in store for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you now listen as the choir sings uh, Noel. It's an ancient word that is synonymous with Christmas. It signifies the Savior's birth. It implies a shout of joy and a song of praise. It calls us to return to the manger to behold the miracle of Emmanuel, God with us. Born 
to join you, I want to remind you that today we don't have Children's Church, it's Communion Sunday, uh, and so uh, the kids have to learn to put up with the pastor just like everybody else, uh, but we are excited. I want to thank you for letting us do an encore presentation of that song. Um, a couple weeks ago when we did the cantata, uh, Robin Spice wasn't able to be here with us because of a, a death in the family, and so uh, Yvonne Bartley very graciously at the last minute filled in for her, uh, but Robin had worked and prepared and had, had rehearsed so faithfully um, that we thought it, you'd be willing to, to listen to it one more time. And so uh, make sure that you tell Robin what a great job that she did. Also, uh, as we congratulate Robin, I also want to congratulate all of you because so far for 2020, you have perfect attendance. <laughs> How many of you think you had perfect attendance in 2019 for the entire year? Anybody? Uh, I know even I was gone for a Sunday or two, but oh well. But we're glad that you're here. I hope that you're glad to be here. Um, you know, at the beginning of a, a new year, it's always an exciting time. Sometimes it's a, you know, it's an opportunity for us to uh, appraise life and uh, to look back and to think about the last year of our lives and to think about what went right. Did anybody have anything that went right the last year? Yeah, you know, a lot of things went right. Uh, some things didn't go, I won't say they went wrong, but maybe they didn't go as we anticipated or expected. And, and again, sometimes in those situations, you know, things don't go the way we expect, they go far better. You know, I always, I always realize the truth that, you know, I have my plans and God's plans are higher, better uh, than mine. And if I just get out of the way and let Him work, um, things always go so much better. But I always like, in, you know, I don't know if it's just the nerd in me, but I always like, whatever situation I'm in, I always like to stop and think, well, what, what did I learn or what can I learn? Uh, in, a, in any given situation. It could be something silly. If I run over to Kears and pick up something and something happens that I didn't expect, I go, well, what can I learn from this? Um, and so th all throughout the year, I, I stop and think about those things that I can learn. 
Uh, this past week, I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with my brother and his two kids and my parents, and had a you know a great visit with them. And I was I was sharing with the people in prayer time that my nephew, um, who is a, he's a typical little boy, a pain, you know, <laughs> you know. But you know, we had this, and I had given them. There was an arcade at that at the hotel we were staying at, and. And, um, you know, I told my son it was a glimmer of hope that I got there. Because after we were all done, he had some change left in his pockets. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay, well, I wonder what he's going to do with that. And then in walks these two little boys, and they see all these arcade games, and they don't have any money. Now, what do you think he'd do? You know, most little boys would be like, hey, let me go show you and get the coin out and start playing the games. No, he, he took this money out and walks up to them and asked them, do you want these? Now, me, I was going, well, wait a second. I gave you that money. It's mine. Give it back to me. No, no, I didn't say that. I just stood there going, hey, you know, I was like, hey. And, of course, uh, we were excited because this past year uh, he accepted the Lord as his Savior and we're so excited uh, when Catherine, uh, Catherine was getting married at the end of March, they're going to come down for the wedding, and we're going to baptize him here. They asked me if we would do that here, so that'll be exciting. But it's one of those things in life, you know, even though that happened in 2020, I sat there and thought, you know what, one thing I can learn is don't make assumptions, you know. <laughs> Yes, it, it is a truth that most little boys are a pain. And I can say that because I was a little boy, you know. But, so it's exciting. New Year's are an opportunity for us to appraise the past. It's also an opportunity for us to aim toward the future. You know, look at where we are and where do we want to be. And then ask, how are we going to get there? Where does God want us to go and how is God going to get us there as well? And of course, it's a time for us to act in the present. And that's really the most important thing. You know, it's, it's interesting to sit there and, and have goals and say, okay, well, this is how we get there. But if you don't actually take those steps to get there, uh, it, nothing is accomplished. And so we as believers in Jesus Christ, we do want to, uh, to be mindful of that. And as we look at this passage from 1 Corinthians 3, uh, we want to apply it in our lives. You know, this passage, this chapter uh, in this letter uh, that God wrote, really, 1 Corinthians is, is very... It's pretty plain about life in the early church. The church uh, was in a, co a community of temptation. Um, and there was a lot of temptations for those believers. And unfortunately, uh, many of them accepted sin and indulged in it. And uh, it's, it's a struggle. And there are consequences. And so the Lord, through Paul, he encourages them to walk the road of purity. You know, And I know, you know, what today is January 5th? You know, anybody make a mistake yet in 2020, in the first four days, five days? Anybody? Say something you shouldn't say, do something you shouldn't do, you know, you know. How many of us made it past noon on January 1st before we could say we did that? You know, we as human beings, you know, we struggle with that. We struggle with that. Uh, but we are mindful, uh, especially in 1 Corinthians, we see in chapter 6, verse 20 of this challenge, it says, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And so every day, perhaps every hour, maybe every moment, we have to remind ourselves that we are His. We're not going to be perfect, although we strive to be perfect. Right? And in the midst of this letter, we find an interesting remark regarding the early church. And for the context, again, uh, we're going to read part, a portion of it. Uh, from chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, but not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. While this 
passage uh, has an interesting context and it focuses uh, to some extent on the leadership of the church and the true leadership of the church. You know, one of the things that they struggled with is, well, they said they followed this one or I followed that one. You know, of course, you know, who do we really follow? Is it Pastor Matthew's church? No. Is it the deacon's church? No. No. It's God's church, right? We come together to worship God, to worship Christ, to worship the Holy Spirit. I have a function, I have a purpose, I have a job in the church, just like you have a function, you have a purpose, you have a job in the church. Is the pastor more important than anybody else in the church? Yes, he is. No. No, he's not. And please don't, you know, no, not at all. I just, this is just the job I've been graciously called to and given. But we all have a job, we all have a purpose as we serve the Lord together and we come together seeking His direction, His guidance. And in this passage we see this wonderful context, this wonderful picture of planting and watering. And we're going to look at this in a little bit. I'm going to read another passage of Scripture for us to look at as well. Uh, very quickly, I tried really hard. I said, okay, I'm going to try to have a short sermon today because it's a Communion Sunday. And I know you don't care how long the sermons go, right? Amen. Right. But we're going to try. It's the beginning of the year. We'll set a goal and see how well we do. But as we look at this, we look at this passage, and we're going to see this idea, uh, look at it as we focus on the idea of assessing our past, aiming for the future, and acting in our present. So to do this, we want to start with that idea of planting. And planting, of course, has several meanings. Of course, there's that literal, the literal idea. And I like literal things. I like practical things. I like to be able to understand things. But the literal idea is to set something into earth. Have you ever planted something, Irene? Yes, you know. Anybody else? We've all probably planted something. You know, we plant, you know, in the springtime or whatever. You know, you get your seeds and you plant them. You know, it's always exciting. And sometimes things appear and sometimes, you know, it just depends. But there's also a figure, a figurative meaning. And that's the idea of to instill doctrine. All right? To instill doctrine or to share truth. To implant truth. And that's what we do very often. You know, when you come to First Baptist Church on a Sunday morning or you come on a Sunday evening, you come to Sunday school, we, we like to plant seed, but we're not actually plant, giving you like a pumpkin seed or an avocado seed or whatever. The seed that we're planting is the Word of God, right? And so that's what we want to think about, and we want to share that. We want to, um, to plant that in our lives. And so with that in the, the back, as our backdrop, we consider this passage this morning. And first, we want to realize... We want to remember that we are planting or sowing. We are doing it. Whether we recognize that we're doing it, realize that we're doing it, whether we want to do it or not, we are planting. With every word we speak, with every action that we take, with every attitude that we demonstrate, we are planting. We are sowing in the lives of others and in our own lives. And Galatians 6, 7 reminds us that whatever a man, whatever a person sows, that he or she, they will also what? Reap. Ooh, I don't like that. You know? Because even though I'm, you know, like Mary Poppins, practically perfect, right? Even though I'm, yeah, even though I'm pretty peppy and optimistic, you know, it isn't always the case. Sometimes I get grumpy. Sometimes I have a bad attitude. Sometimes I get frustrated. Sometimes I get irritated. Not with any of you or anyone ever watching this video. <laughs> you know. But it reminds us that what we sow, we're going to reap. It's that, pr that principle, that doctrine, that idea. That we as people, we are sowers. We are planters. What we sow, we reap. What we reap, we harvest. Matthew 7, 16 reminds us, it says, Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And there's that idea again. You know? If I sow division, guess what I'm going to reap? Division. If I'm always critical of other people, guess what I'm going to get back? Criticism. Now, of course, I share that with you all. So throughout the whole year of 2020, none of you will ever criticize anything that I do, anything that I say, you know. 
Is that the message? No. There is helpful, healthy, positive, constructive criticism. And do we need that? Yes. yes. That's why Scripture says speak the truth in love, right? But sometimes we don't speak the truth in love. We speak the truth with cynicism, with malice. Sometimes people make things up. And I'm not just talking about those people in Washington. We must realize that whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we are planting seed through our lives, through our words, through our actions, through our deeds. And to use this figurative definition, we are instilling doctrine. You know, we come to church and we say God is love and we love each other. But do we really demonstrate that outside these walls? How do we plant? Again, in word and deed, in attitude and action, in time. So the question is, looking back over 2019, what did we plant? As a church, as a family, personally, what did we plant? What was our focus? What was our message? Was it self-centered or was it Christ-centered? We were planting seed. We were installing or instilling doctrine. And again, were we planting unity or division, faith or disbelief, hope or despair? What doctrine did we instill in the lives of the people that we came across last year? Was it God-honoring? What would we change? Would you change anything from last year? Yeah. And of course, it's very unusual that we'd actually be able to change it, but we can learn from it again. Another thing is we find ourselves in the midst of 2020, we must ask the Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to plant in 2020? Again, we as individuals, we as a family, we as a church, as a congregation, God, what do you want us to do? You know? What do you want us to instill in the lives of other people, in our own lives as well, in our community? Do we want to instill anything? Do we want to share truth, do we, the truth? Do we want to instill doctrine in this community that we live in? Or do we just say, eh, they're not worth our time. They dress funny. They smell funny. They look funny. They are funny. Oh, wait, that's us. What should be our focus, our priority, our mission? You know, we often look at that from the perspective of other people. We like to go, well, for the pastor, this is what his priority should be next year. For the deacons, this, is, should, be, this should be their goal. For the Sunday school, school teachers, they should do this. For the trustees, and we can come up with all kinds of lists and of things that other people should do, other priorities, other goals that they should have, and we never really get down to what about <coughs> me. But we have to ask those questions. We have to say, okay, God, what is it that you want us to do in this coming year? What is it that you want us to focus on? What is it that you want us to work toward as a body of believers? There's that old adage, if you aim at nothing, what? You hit it every time. You know, we think about living in a farming community. We don't think about it. We do live in a farming community. And we know that those farmers, what? They contemplate what crops they're going to plant. Because it makes it, doesn't it, does it make a difference which crop you plant and how you do different things? Yeah. It makes a difference how we approach the field. And that is true for us today. You know, in the Clay Center schools, they teach the students to begin with the, do you remember? What are they, to begin? To begin with the end in mind. And so too, we as disciples of Christ, as believers in Jesus Christ, we must do the same thing. For many people, they don't know what to do, and that, that's what's difficult. People are like, well, I don't know. I want God to use me. 
But I don't know how. I don't know what to plant. I don't know what to instill. Well, quickly, and I mean quickly, here's the real sermon. How do you like that? I'm going to give you five actions or attitudes that we can and should. I know some of you said, I've already filled up all my paper for my notes with something else. Well, turn that paper over. Steal the paper from the person next to you who's not taking notes. Five actions, very quickly, very quickly. I'm not going to go too deep in any of these because you, you, you know what they are. But five actions or attitudes that we can and we should plant in the coming years. And these actions are demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ. They're shared in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of other, others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, or equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's Philippians 2, 3 to 8. And in there we see five things. And the, to make it easy for you, all of them start with S. S. The first one is that we want to and we need to plant and demonstrate and instill the idea of selflessness. Selflessness. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You know, this world is just jam-packed with selfishness. We look for to satisfy ourselves. We look to take care of ourselves. You know. Selflessness is the idea of being concerned with others. Being concerned with others. This year, you know, what does that look like for you? It can be something very simple. It could be something huge. But take the opportunities. Ask the Lord. Say, God, give me an opportunity to be selfless. But if you ask that, you have to be prepared to do that. You can't say, well, God, let me have an opportunity to be selfless. And then when you get to the Mexican restaurant for lunch, you run in before everybody else because you don't want to stand and wait for the table. You know, I can only use that illustration because I'm staying home for dinner today, for lunch today. So... You won't see me running. And anyways, I never run because I always pull up right to the door and kick one of my kids out and say, go get the table for us. <laughs> but selflessness, putting others first, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down their lives for their friends. That's selflessness. You know, you say, well, this, that's kind of a silly thing to talk about. That's a silly goal to have. No. <coughs> As a church, that's what we ought to be all about. Amen. Selflessness. Selflessness. And we see that in Philippians 2. The next one is sacrifice. And I'm like, oh, I know. It's kind of like, oh. I was okay with selfless. But sacrifice? It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And sacrifice is giving up something. But it's really giving it up for something more important. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times, you know, I get tired at the end of the day. I want to sit down and do something and just relax. Do you ever want to just relax? You know? And then somebody will call or somebody will say something or one of my kids will need something. And, you know, I, 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 I can't say that I do it every time, but I try to. I try purposefully to do that. If they need something, I'm there. But it's that idea. I could, and it's, it's tied with selflessness, but it's that idea of putting the needs of others first. We're going to see that again, but that idea of sacrificing one thing for something that's more important. Resting my tired feet are not as important, it's not as important as spending time with my son, Lucas. Danielle always reminds me he's only young once, and he's nine. So he's fat. He's not in the room so I can talk about him. He's fast approaching that time when he's not going to want to be with his cool Baptist pastor father. <laughs> you know? Elliot, you know, you, you ought to hang out with me all the time, right? <laughs> Don't lie. Not, no, no. You know. And even if I wasn't a cool Baptist pastor father, you know, 
part of the growing up, you know, you have to have that separation. And so she reminds me, and I remind her, and we make choices to make sure that we're investing in our kids. But it's that idea of sacrificing. Sometime this year, sometime this week, maybe even today, you're going to be called to sacrifice what you want to do in order to do something else that God is going to call you to do. And again, it may not be going on a mission trip to outer Slavolia or wherever, you know. It may be simply going into the other room or going across the hall or going to a, a, an office down the hallway or picking up the phone or sending a tweet or a Snapchat or a message or an email or a text. But we need to be willing to do that. The third one we see here is he said he took the form of a bondservant, and that's the idea of service, helping others, ministering others, meeting needs. And again, some of these are kind of repetitive, but it's that same idea. It's all about love, right? But serving, you know. We, you know, it, it's, it's always one of those things. We always think that we like to be served, right? Because we, you know, but when people actually do serve us, sometimes it's a little bit, ugh. We get a little, you know, we take a step back. I remember every time we've gone on a mission trip when we go with the youth works people, at the end of the trip, they do the foot washing thing and people just get, <sighs> and you'd think that the hard part would be washing the other person's feet, but it isn't. It's allowing them to wash your feet. You have to humble yourself to let them do that, you know. And so sometimes in this idea of services, we have to allow each other you have to, I have to allow you to serve me, and you have to allow me to serve you, and you have to be willing to serve me, and I have to be willing to serve you. That's family, right? <clears throat> you know, when we're at home, we're with our brothers and sisters, our nieces and nephews, our children, we don't think anything of it. We do it. Why? Because we love them. Well, guess what? You've got to love me. <laughs> and I've got to love you. And I guess I should say, I get to love you. you know? Selflessness, sacrifice, service. One of the hard ones, it says, And being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient. We see that in Philippians 2, but that's the idea of submission. Yielding to the authority of God. Submitting. You know? And it is hard sometimes. You know, in the middle of something, when we think we know what we're doing, and we think we've got it, we think we've got it all mapped out, everything's going to be great, and then something happens, and we're like, ugh. Oh. Yes. You know. But submission is recognizing that we aren't in control. We aren't in charge. You know, we fool ourselves. We think we are. We say, well, yep, we're Americans. We're in charge. I'm the captain of my own destiny. Until I look behind me in the rearview mirror and there's these lights that are flashing. I roll down my window and I say, I'm sorry, officer, I'm in charge. Be away, you know, away with you. Be gone. What do they do? Oh, yep, sorry, I didn't know it was you, Matthew. Yep, bye-bye. <laughs> they call out the SWAT team, you know. We think we're in charge. We're not in charge. We fool ourselves. You know? And the reality is, we don't want to be in charge. It's a lot of responsibility to be in charge. You know? I remember when I was an assistant pastor for two years. I loved it. I thought I could do this for the rest of ever. I could be there. You just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Don't make me have to think for myself. You know. And the reality is, is that what we, that's what we do with God. We go, no, no, I got this, I got this. He's like, no, Matthew, this is what I want you to do. Do this and then this and then this. And we go, no, no, God. You're so silly. You're so traditional. You're so conservative. So old-fashioned, God. Then we go, oh, wait, no. You're so right. Last week we talked a little bit about the idea of worship, the idea of what does worship mean? To, to bow down and to kiss the ground as a demonstration of our affection for God, but also of His authority. 
And that's what we do because we submit to him because he's in charge. And he's benevolent, you know, so loving, so gracious. So we're selfless, we sacrifice, we serve, we submit. And the last one is, you don't want this one, but suffer. We may be called to suffer. And we needed an S word, but it's to the point, it says in, in the scripture, he submitted even to the point of the death, to the point of death, even death on the cross. And the idea here is this year in 2020, as we plant seed, as we instill doctrine, you know what? We may have to go outside our comfort zone. You may not be tortured, and I pray that that does not happen, but you may be asked to go outside your comfort zone. You may be asked to talk to someone that you don't know. You may be asked to visit with somebody that you don't really like. You may be asked to visit with somebody that doesn't really like you. But I've often experienced, you know, or often realize that it's never as bad as we think it's going to be. Because if God has led you get there, guess what? God has prepared the way. So we just need to trust. That's part of that submission. So we are planting, we are sowing, we are instilling. That's what we want to do. That's what we are going to do. So let's do the best that we can do, right? As we begin this year, let us consider the goals that we have for ourselves, for our family, for our congregation. Let us encourage ourselves and our family and our congregation to be a group of people that are selfless, that are sacrificing, that are serving, that are submissive, that are willing to suffer for one another. Let us seek to live a life that demonstrates the qualities and the characteristics of Jesus Christ. After all, we do call him our Lord, don't we? We call him our Savior, right? We say that we worship him. We say that we're believers, that we're followers, we're disciples. So why wouldn't we? Why don't we? Let us selflessly sacrifice and serve others as we submit to the Lord, being willing to suffer to benefit others. Did you get that written down, Vicki? Yep. Okay, good. That is the goal. That is the goal for us for 2020. Will you pray with me? Father God, we do thank you so very much for the opportunity to look at your word. And we are thankful for these letters that have been given to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to each of our hearts, that you would challenge and encourage us to be people that are willing to demonstrate these five characteristics, these five traits, these five actions and attitudes, Lord, so that as we go through 2020, we can be a church, we can be a people that are planting seed that will produce what you want it to produce. That we will not be people that are sowing uh, division, disunity, despair, disbelief, but rather we are sowing traits and words and actions and deeds that encourage unity and faith and belief and hope and trust in you. For you are worthy of it. We pray that if there's anyone here this, this morning that doesn't know you as their Savior, that this would be the day that they make that choice. That they would recognize, as Scripture teaches us, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death. That the gift of God is eternal life. And that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so we pray that as we have this moment of reflection and response, Lord, that You would speak to our hearts. That You would help us to make choices and decisions that glorify you and that demonstrate our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we have our hymn of response?
as the deacons come forward and we prepare for communion, you may be seated. And I invite you to continue to have a prayerful attitude as Greg White shares our communion prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, as we come before you this morning, we just praise and thank you for just a new year you've laid before us. We thank you, Lord, for this, the death of Jesus on the cross and what it means to us. And as we celebrate that today, we just ask, Lord, that you would just unburden our hearts as we focus upon the cup and upon the juice. In your name we pray. Amen. she plays, I do remind you, you don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church to participate in communion. You don't have to be a member of any Baptist Church to participate in communion with us. But you have to have, uh, you have to, to know that Jesus is your Savior. Uh, and so if, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we invite you to share communion with us. Father, as we humble ourselves before you this morning, as we hold this tiny morsel of bread, it is re it's a reminder to us that the bread was broken that Passover when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And Jesus broke the bread and said it was his body that was broken for us. He was broken that we would be made whole. But Father, this morning we come before you and we pray, Lord, that you would break our hearts Break those old ways of doing things. Break those ways that we, those times when we are, are set in our ways and unwilling to be moved, Lord. Give us a spirit that desires to serve selflessly and submissively. 
ready to sacrifice and to suffer for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we pray. Lord, as we hold this cup, we are mindful that it is symbolic of your blood which was shed for us. And in that statement, there is so much <coughs> true, unconditional, unsurpassing, limitless love. And Father, as we share this cup together this morning, may we be mindful of that love that has been poured out upon us. And may we allow the truth of that to echo throughout our hearts and minds and lives. So much so that it encourages us to demonstrate that love, that kind of love, in the life of another person. Lord, we pray that as we partake together this morning, that it will be a demonstration of the true unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand now and take the hand of someone near you as we sing our closing song.
destinations. We pray, Lord, that you would give us opportunity today and throughout this week to plant seed, to instill doctrine in the lives of others, a doctrine of seed that will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.